Well, thank you for the introduction, Matthew. It is great to finally speak with you guys. I have presented for uh, Sequoia here in San Mateo and for Golden Gate up in the city and Ohlone on the other side of the bay. So Santa Clara is kind of the missing piece to the Bay Area puzzle. So I'm glad we could make this happen. Uh, and I'm glad we can make it happen right now. It's like the most critical time for the book. So uh, my flight is at 1110. So I'm going to kind of tear through this so that I can get to the airport afterwards. But uh, hopefully it won't be boring and uh, it certainly won't be quiet. So I tend to get a, a bit enthusiastic about this. But I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a roadmap of this talk. So uh, I'm going to give you some relevant background. So my birding experience, uh, my education, my scientific career, and some relevant personal stuff. I won't go into the personal stuff as much during the talk because there's a lot of that in the book and I don't necessarily want to give the entire book away. Um, but you guys can ask about that stuff in the question session if you'd like to. Uh, I'll spend a bit of time talking about why I decided to do a big year. I fall in between the two traditional big year camps. Uh, there's lots of 20 somethings who do these shoestring budget big years kind of before their career is up and rolling or before they have families while well, they're still kind of feeling out what their, what their adult life is going to look like. And then on the other side of that, you have people who are a bit older, kind of 60s, 70s who have piled up enough cash, potentially even retired where they can kind of throw a whole bunch of money at the problem and take the whole year and not have to worry about coming and going from a job or from a family and so on and so forth. So I, I fell right in the middle because I was 35 years old when I embarked on this, this adventure. And that will have some major, has had some major repercussions, which I'll explain. Um, most of the trip is just gonna, most of the talk is going to be a whirlwind tour of what I saw and did during my bike big year. So that's just kind of like a narrated two-wheeled uh, tour of the United States. And then at the end, I'll try to button it up and tell you what I learned from the experience and why I'm so, so happy that I took the plunge to do this first of its kind adventure. Ah, okay. Let me see here. Uh, so this is that little pinhead on the right there with the braces is me at age 12. So I actually started birding at age seven. Uh, I connected with birding when my family moved from the urban kind of confines of downtown Philadelphia to a more suburban uh, and green sector of the city called Chestnut Hill, which is where I spent my youth. Uh, right at that time, I kind of walked into the backyard, which was like the wild wild west at that stage for me and i noticed finches and waxwings and wrens and jays and crows and so on and so forth and i just wanted to know what it all was and so i my mom got me a bird book i got some binoculars from my dad's stuff and just kind of started teaching myself what the birds in the yard were uh my mom was in a gardening group with this woman and my mom i'll tell you the woman was in a second and my mom was like oh i got this bird obsessed kid and the woman is like, oh, I've got this bird obsessed husband. And it turns out the bird obsessed husband was Robert Ridgely of South American ornithology fame, who worked at the, still does work, actually used to work at the Academy of Natural Sciences. So he ended up as my birding mentor as a kid. So he and I would go out birding, I don't know, twice a month on the weekends, and do stuff around the Delaware Valley. And it was, it was Robert who plugged me into the Victor Emanuel youth camps. And so I ended up attending a bunch of youth camps. I did Camp Chiricahua in 91, and Camp Cascades in 92 and then Camp Cielo in Mexico in 93 and Camp Tejano in, in Texas in 1995. Uh, that was all before I was about 14 or 15. And at that stage, I had I was kind of on the path, at least in my own mind, to being an ornithologist. I wanted to marry some some of my birding interest with kind of like research and, and scientific curiosity, which I was clearly developing even at that young age. Uh, some decisions kind of from there out kind of set a different course for me. And the first of those is I went to boarding school. So I went to one of these kind of dead poet <laughs> society, scent of a woman type high powered prep schools in New England. I went to Hotchkiss and the demands of boarding school was such that there wasn't a lot of free time to do any extra, any what I would call unstructured extracurricular activities. Uh, so that started the demise uh, of my birding interest. But once I discovered alcohol at age 17, that was kind of the death nail for my birding interest. I have alcoholism on both sides of my family. Um, and so the genetics were there and there were some insecurities, which I discussed in the book, which contributed to the problem as well. But once I discovered alcohol at age 17, drinking and partying became my primary extracurricular interest. Uh, and that ran until when I got when I turned 30 and I won't tell the story of how I got sober today. That's told in, in, in detail in the book. And I don't for time reasons have the time to go into all of that, but I, I reconnected with birding when I got sober at age 30 and I'll kind of put that into context in a second here. 
But the other thing is that I also, I fell in love with molecular biology. And especially once I started drinking, I didn't want to go sit in the woods and, 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 and be detached from, I didn't want to go sit in South American jungles or some far away place. I wanted to be in a city. And so uh, my science, like molecular biology would allow me to do that. And so kind of in my time at Stanford, my, my goal switched from being an ornithologist to being a molecular biologist and a geneticist. And so I did a BS in biological sciences with a focus in in biochemistry and molecular biology at Stanford. So that's four years that I pushed into this career track there. I then went and became a research assistant at Harvard from 2001 to 2004. And there I worked on uh, basically how does an embryo know where to put its head and put its feet and by default, like where to put its left and its right. So I worked on how an embryo molecularly breaks these asymmetries so as to manifest the different axes during development. So I was working in very, very early embryos there. I really loved the problems of developmental biology, basically how do you build an organism from an intrinsic genetic blueprint? And so I went and did a PhD in developmental genetics and molecular cell biology at NYU. And there I worked on cell polarity. So cell polarity is the process through which cells regionalize cell function. So for instance, an intestinal cell, uh, there's a directionality of function. An intestinal cell absorbs food on one side uh, from your digestive tract and then packages that into shipping containers called vesicles and sends it to the other side, sends the nutrients to the other side of the cell and dumps them into the bloodstream. So there's like a directionality of function and most of the cells in your body have some degree of directionality or polarity to them. And how polarity is established has major implications for development and disease. So I specifically worked on how early embryonic cells polarize. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed that. And it, I should mention in the timeline here, I basically through that trajectory of Stanford, Harvard, NYU is like the core of my, of my drinking run. So that whole time I was, I was kind of a blackout bedwetting cocaine abusing disaster. And the drugs came in more and more as I went along in that trajectory. I was also DJing and working at nightclubs. So, uh, I was putting myself in like all the wrong places, uh, but I got sober at the end of my PhD that is described uh, in gory detail in the book. And then I took a postdoctoral fellowship at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, where I worked on synapse plasticity. So specifically how over developmental time do neurons change their pattern of connectivity with surrounding neurons and in changing the pattern of connectivity, thereby change the information flow through the circuit. So the word stuff that I was working on is very relevant for uh, schizophrenia and autism, which are thought to be improper modification of synapses over developmental time. So I had pushed all this time into becoming a college professor. I had articulated this goal that I wanted to be a college professor to everybody. So when my research, when my postdoctoral research started to wobble and I started to question my trajectory, uh, it was really, really frustrating. And one of the things, several of the things I realized about science uh, were kind of like starting to sour me on the whole process. And the first was how competitive it was. And it wasn't cutthroat in that it's like people sabotaging one another's experiments. It's just that there were very, very few good professorships opening up at places like Stanford and the University of Michigan or Emory or University of Texas or these big research institutions. And so whenever one of them did, they got 800 applicants that all had an undergrad from Princeton and a PhD from Harvard or a resume like mine or an undergrad at Oxford and then postdoc in China or whatever. And so it was super competitive and people just spent all their time in their lab. Uh, and I don't know if I wanted to do that for my entire life. Uh, research funding has contracted uh, starting in like the late nineties. And so it's been much harder to get funding. Success is formulaic in that like you have, everybody's trying to publish their papers in the same journals, speak at the same conferences, secure the same fellowships, get the same people of, to, to write them letters of recommendation. Um, so it's again, kind of fueling this, this competition aspect. Um, there's a huge element of chance and luck in that I saw a lot of really talented people floundering because they were on the wrong project. And I never got to use what I now understand of my best skills, which I think are my ability to communicate, inspire and motivate other people. And I could have done that in an academic setting, but I would have been working within this like superstructure. Whereas now, as an adventurer and author, I kind of create my own world, so to speak. So those glowing things on the right are the embryos that I worked on as a graduate student. They're not people, don't worry, they're small worms. Um, but the bottom line is that academic science was a career that I wanted to date forever, but never marry. And so into this confusion uh, that I was experiencing this time, and I, I didn't want to leave because as soon as I left academia, it would be like this big, huge red arrow pointing me saying failure. Like you've articulated this goal of being a professor and now you're going to leave without accomplishing that goal. So that by definition makes you a failure. And so I, 
I was really struggling with like how to how to move forward in my future when Hurricane Sandy, this is at the I started my postdoc at the beginning of 2011. So this is the end of my second postdoctoral year. Hurricane Sandy came up the East Coast and birding, my birding, I got sober in 2010 and my birding interest had kind of been reignited for about three years at this stage. And so when I found out there were two northern lapwings that had been dragged across the Atlantic and dropped on Nantucket, which is an island off the Massachusetts coast, by the storm, I got super excited. And I was like, I've got to get these birds for my ma for my uh, North American list. This will be such a great addition. And so the problem was that Nantucket is an island and getting there is a little bit of a headache, especially in the wake of a hurricane. And so I formulated a plan where I would drive from Boston to Hyannis, which is on Cape Cod, and then I would hop the ferry and ride out to uh, to Nantucket on the ferry, and then I arranged to rent a bicycle uh, from a bike shop there uh, because the island taxi service is shut down through the winter, and I didn't want to pay three or four hundred bucks to put my car under the ferry. It's like highway robbery. So the guy at the bike store was like, "Look, if you're crazy enough to come out here and rent a bike and ride around in the wake of a hurricane, I'll rent it to you. It'll cost you thirty five bucks, and I'll wish you the best of luck." So. That's what I did. So I drove to Hyannis. I got on the boat for two and a half hours. I took the boat out there. I biked five, I guess it was about four miles from the dock to where the lapwings were. And boom, I got Northern Lapwing. And I should actually say it was pouring rain. It was probably like 40 degrees and raining. So it was miserable. Um, but I scored these birds. I spent like an hour photographing them and watching them. And then I hopped back on the bike in the rain and rode back to the dock and got on the ferry and went back to Boston. But like that whole time of, of riding the ferry and driving back to Boston, I was like, man, that, that chase was like totally different than anything I've ever done. Granted, I kind of went by like land and sea, but there, there was something different. And I realized it was the bicycle. And I was like, man, the, the bike was really fun. Like this bike birding thing is really, really interesting. Like, is there, is there a precedent for bike birding? Is there, do people run bike birding trips? Is, are there bike birding clubs? And then my mind kind of wandered even further and said, well, has anybody done a bicycle big year? Because that would be the coolest project ever. And while I'm sure that most of you know what a big year is, and I'm sure almost all of you have seen this silly movie over here made, I don't know, 2011 or something. So this, this movie had come out a couple of years before I conceived this idea, which was helpful because it primed the American public for what I was doing. Uh, but basically, the, a big year is basically an avian, an avian treasure hunt that lasts an entire calendar year. So they run from January 1st to December 31st. And people employ, employ planes, cars, boats, helicopters, all sorts of modes of transportation to crisscross the continent in search of birds to, to add to their big year lists. Uh, you need a lot of money to be able to do this. And the general strategy is to chase the rarities around and fill in the resident birds. Uh, if you're going at this hardcore, if you're kind of just doing it like I do, then the rarities mean a little bit less and you kind of spend some more time enjoying the residents. But uh, for the people who are going after the record, they have to make sure to get every rarity starting on January 1st. And non-birders always ask, uh, well, how do you know if you saw bird X, Y, or Z? Like, can't somebody just lie about it? And I'm like, yeah, well, people these days try to take pictures, but it's traditionally been an honor system. And they're like, well, what stops people from lying? And I say, well, nothing. But I'm of the mindset that you only get so many good lies in your life. Like, you, you can't tell lies endlessly before you get caught. And so you have to decide when you're actually going to lie and when you're going to use one of your good lies. So it's like, no officer, that is not my kilogram of cocaine in the trunk is a good time to use a lie. Or like, I did not have sexual relations with that person is a good time to use a lie. I saw pygmy nuthatch is not a good time to use up one of your lies. Like if you have to, if you have to lie about what birds you're seeing, then you're in it for the wrong reasons and you should probably get out. Uh, so I did a bunch of research on this bike birding thing to see what was out there. And I came across this Canadian kid and his parents, he was, uh, Malcolm was 15 and his family took a, a 12 month loop through the U S and Canada and tallied 548 species. Now their adventure was not a, a, a textbook big year because they went June to June. So they started in Canada and then went to the Southern U S for the winter and then back to Canada. But it kind of gave me an idea of what a person could expect to find on a 12 month bike trip. Importantly, Jim Royer here in California did a San Luis Obispo based bicycle big year in 2010. And he found 318 species, which by the definite, the letter of the law was the, was the record when I, when I conceived this idea. Now I did these internet searches at the end of 2012, but I've included Mark Kudrav and Ron Beck in this because they 
did their bike big year in 2013 while well, I was like still waffling whether I was going to do this or not. So Mark found 328 species, 326 species in California in 2013. And Ron Beck found 301 in Cochise County in Arizona. And I also throw those two guys up because I got to stay with both of them and bike bird with both of them uh, on my adventure. So and Mark Kudrav is like a, a local guy. So it's always good to get the, the local people some props. Um, and I think that I was, I was at a point in my life where I wanted my own adventure. Like I was looking at my scientific trajectory and my postdoctoral project had just cratered. And I, if I had stuck it out, if I had kind of restarted my rebooted my postdoctoral fellowship with another project, like if I spent five or six, maybe even another seven years, uh, some reputable university would have given me a lab, but then I would have had to fight for six to seven years to get tenure. And then I would have like had to fight to keep, keep getting funding after like there's no end in sight and so i just did a point in my life where I, I didn't just want to move into biotech i didn't just want to go into teaching i didn't want to go work on wall street i wanted to have an adventure like i wanted to go and and do something totally different and so like you read these books as a kid and i read into thin air as an adult but like i just kind of hearkened back to how i felt while reading those books and i felt this need to become like a similar protagonist and so i quit my job and well i should say uh, I thought of, it took me about six months before I could actually get up the the gumption to quit my job. Like I, it was like the most miserable six months of my life, but with a lot of support and love from my then girlfriend and now wife, I made the decision to do that. Uh, sorry, the thing is giving me a little bit of problems here. There we go. And I, I did think that there were two problems with the big year model. And I, I realized that the bicycle would let me solve for both of them. One is that no matter how much cash I had, uh, money wouldn't turn the pedals for me. Like I'd have to do that. And the bike is a very egalitarian way to travel in that respect. And I also realized that I would eliminate this fossil fossil fuel consumption. And I realized that doing a big year is not going to be the the, the straw that breaks the, the climate's back. But at the same time, I do think that there is conflict between travel uh, for birding purposes and, and conservation. Um, and I'll come back to that at the end as well. So, and I thought the bike would be a hell of an adventure. You know, I think that a big year is an adventure with the planes, trains, cars, and so on and so forth. But on a bike, I thought it would be totally different. So I, I sat down and I kind of in the beginning of 2000, I quit my job in April of 2013. I gave my boss eight months notice that I was out at the end of the year. And so I basically spent the rest of the year working to pile up funds. I just worked on other people's projects, helping them advance their careers versus advancing my own. And the rest of the time I worked on planning this adventure. So the route is everything because you can't pick up the pen and move the bike the same way that you can uh, on a petroleum powered big year where a flight from LA to New York is like a six hour formality. Uh, so, and there's no precedent for this. Like nobody had done a January to December big year in the lower 48 states before. So I sat down with the field guide and the goal was to minimize riding and maximize species. So I identified a number of key areas with time constraints. And those were the Texas coast in April. So I could get all of the neotropical migrants that nest in the eastern half of the country. Arizona in May and June, which would allow me to get a lot of traditionally Latin American species that just creep across the border there. Um, it made sense to do the Rockies in July and August because it'd be too hot to be in the Sun Belt and it would be the best time of the year to be there because it wouldn't be too much snow obscuring my path. And then obviously if I did the east, eastern migrants in the spring, I'd want to do the western migrants in the fall. So being in California in September and October was, was a really good move. And then there were three areas that had some flexibility. So the first of those was the Northeast in winter. And I realized very on that very early on that if I wanted to have a shot at 600 species, the only way to do it would be to include the Northeastern United States as miserable as I knew that would be after having lived in Boston, New York, and Philly in, in various capacities. Um, I knew that I'd have to go to the lower Rio Grande Valley in winter. And I knew that I couldn't do both the Northeast at the beginning of the year, I couldn't do the Northeast and the Rio Grande Valley in the same winter. So it meant I had to start in one and end in the other. And then Florida had some flexibility. I knew that I would sacrifice some species like Antillean Nighthawk, for instance, not being there between, say, April and August. But uh, I needed to be at other points in the country. And unlike somebody on a plane, I, I couldn't be in two places on the same day. And so taking those time constraints, taking these, these various considerations into account and then calculating what would be the shortest line that would let me connect these places, this is... This is this is the the route that I that I cooked up, and I, I kind of drew this map as a joke, and to to spoil things a little bit, I'm going to show you the route that I actually rode. Now I will tell you I had done zero cycling before I came up with this idea. The lapwing pursuit was the only cycling that I had done since like leaving college. I rode a bike around when I was at Stanford. I had not ridden a bike other than that eight mile round trip chase for the lapwing. So this was like totally insane. 
but to show you, this is the route that I designed kind of as a joke with no cycling experience. And this is the route that I ultimately ended up riding. And so the big difference, and I'll come back to this later in the talk, as you can see in the previous slide, I don't make it up to uh, the Pacific Northwest. But I don't make it specifically to Washington State, but in my book, in my kind of actual route that I rode, I do. And so uh, I kind of severely underestimated the amount of cycling that I'd be able to do and was able to ride further than I thought I could. So that's kind of how the, the genesis of the adventure, um, like I said, I had to leave my career to do this. So it was a huge decision. It was like, it was, it was as emotional as getting a divorce. Like I was, I was leaving the only career that I had known for 16 years. And honestly, I was good at it and I had a future in it. It just wasn't making me happy. And I think that happiness was something that I was hoping to find as I pedaled the bike around even more so than birds. And I eventually found it and it wasn't necessarily on the road, but in the outflow of like the doors that the adventure opened up, but I'll come back at the, at, at the end. So now I'm starting a bicycle big year in Massachusetts on January 1st. And uh, the first day, the temperature started out at 10 degrees and it got up as high as 27. So it was cold, as you can see. And the first bird that I saw was snowy owl. And that's pretty cool because that had given so many other big year birders fits in petroleum powered iterations of this game. That is not the snowy owl that I saw. That's about the fifth one that I saw in this morning. Uh, the first one I saw flew across the road in the dark as I was riding out to the beach to look for short-eared owl. So the first individual bird I saw was snowy owl. The second individual bird I saw was snowy owl. The third individual bird I saw was short-eared owl that snowy owl number two is chasing. And the fourth bird I saw was a bald eagle that flew overhead about 30 seconds later. So my big ear got off to an amazing start. Uh, I also found a black-headed gull on the first day. This was self-found. I was scanning through Bonaparte's gulls on the Merrimack River, and this gull flew into, flew into view and gave me the chance to snap a few pics of it. Uh, so it was a really good start. I got, I don't know, 35, 37 species on the first day and was off and running. And I spent the next week kind of birding my way through South, South through Massachusetts, Rhode Island, eventually went through Connecticut and New York. Actually, I should, well, getting ahead of myself. Um, so that was all on January 1st. Now, this is the forecast. I took a screenshot of this from, from the web, knowing that I'd have a good story to tell after all of this. So this is tonight, January 1st, 2014. So you can see that the temperature is supposed to drop precipitously across those three days and it's supposed to snow. Well, they were mostly right about the temperature. It ended up being, by the time I got back on the road on the fourth, I was completely housebound on the second and third. I, I tried to go down to the beach to do some sea watching on the second. This is right as the storm started and my eyes froze shut. So I couldn't even see anything, it was totally useless. Um, so that's the morning of the second. The rest of the second and all day of the third were spent feeder watching at my host's house because uh, it was it was ridiculous. I couldn't go out. And when I got back on the bike on the morning of the fourth, there was 10 degrees below zero and there were 18 to 20 inches of snow on the ground. So this is what the landscape looked like when I got back on the bike on January 4th. And it was equally crazy and beautiful uh, at the same time. So I think that there have been some people who have done bike bike birding projects since then and have probably ridden in conditions similar to this. But at this moment, I am fairly confident in saying that no other birder on earth had experienced anything like this as I biked the 30 miles in, in sub-zero temperatures from Newburyport to Gloucester, which was the next stop on my tour. And I got a bunch of cool birds there, but that gives you an idea of what I was up against like right out of the gate. And January and February of 2014 are still the two coldest months on record in the Northeastern United States. Um, I hit snowstorms like all down the East Coast. So it snowed uh, on the second and the third. It snowed again on the sixth as I was leaving Massachusetts. It snowed as I went through Rhode Island. It snowed as I went through New York City. It snowed a foot uh, while I was at my parents' house in Philadelphia. That's the same storm that got Delaware. So I'm now in like below the Mason Dixon line where I'm thinking it's going to be above freezing and there's still like seven or eight inches of snow on the ground. Uh, that first month, it took me a month to go from New England to, to like Delaware um the temperature got above freezing one time for two hours on january 6th and every other day the temperature was like in the 20s and the teens or single digits so that's what i mean by it was really cold it was just abnormally cold it was it was it was brutal but the fact that mother nature scheduled the downtime that as an addict i'm not disciplined enough to schedule for myself probably paid dividends later in the year because it, it prevented me from burning out too early 
So that was in Delaware. From Delaware, I went down into Maryland and then into Virginia with the stop at the White House. I always think that that's a that's a good picture to show. Um, and then this is kind of like summarizes what I what happened in the Northeast. So these are the birds that I targeted in the Northeast. And you can see green is obviously things that I saw. So I was able to get things like thick-billed myrrh and dovekey and black-headed gull and a bunch of different owls and northern shrike and king eider from my bike, uh, having familiarity with Gloucester and the Massachusetts coast during my postdoctoral years, uh, facilitated a lot of those, but I did really, really well in the Northeast under like absolutely, absolute the worst imaginable conditions. I missed black legged kitty wake. And that ended up ultimately being my worst miss for the whole year. Every time I went down to the beach to look for it or to a jetty to look for it, it snowed and I couldn't see but 10 feet out to sea. little gull I missed in the Northeast, but then got in, in Texas at the end of the year. Uh, and barnacle goose was a really nice get. It was a bummer not to get uh, white winged crossbill and the red poles, but it wasn't a good finch year, so none of those birds were around. Um, so now I've kind of left Delaware and DC, and I'm heading down to Florida. I spent most of February commuting through the South. Uh, I picked up things like salt marsh sparrow and Nelson sparrow and brown headed nuthatch and white ibis as I move south. And then I got down to Florida, and there was a real explosion of birds. I finally got my lifer snail kite which was a bird that I had managed to miss on two previous trips to Florida, albeit many years prior to the bike big year. Uh, it was a lot of fun birding at places like the Bocota Hatchie wetlands and the Green K wetlands where the birds are big, slow, colorful, and tame and right next to the boardwalk. Uh, and it's warm and I'm birding in shorts and sandals. So that was super cool. Uh, I got Lasagras flycatcher down there uh, at Matheson Hummocks uh, Park. And that is the same bird that Neil Hayward saw right at the end of his record-breaking 2013 petroleum-powered big year when he broke Sandy Comito's long-standing record of 748 from 1997, 1998, one of those two years. So it's kind of fun to see the same bird on my big year as Neil saw on his, the same individual bird. Uh, that uh, good-looking Hispanic gentleman up there is Angel Abreu. No, he is not in a Cuban-American boy band, although he looks like he could be. He is a bird guide in Southern Florida and uh, people put me in touch with him and I explained to him that I couldn't get in the car and drive around Metro Miami looking for exotics. So he drove his car out with a junkie bike and met me and we rode around South Florida, like around Metro Miami together. And that was super cool because he, as a Cuban American, could give me like a running narrative, a running history on the whole like cultural history of Miami. So it was awesome to get that from him. He helped me find spot-breasted Oriole and white crown pigeon and white winged parakeet. And to that point in the trip, it was like my absolute favorite day of the year because of the effort that Angel made to travel according to my self-imposed limitations. Um, that put Victor at the bottom. I spent a lot of time looking for mangrove cuckoo, both on the Atlantic side and the Gulf side of the peninsula. I missed it at many different places. And I was actually riding from Santa, I missed it at Sanibel Island and I was riding back across the causeway to Bunch Beach, which is a well-known spot for this bird. And I saw this bird standing in the water. And so I jumped off my bike and I was like, okay, I gotta wait a few minutes for the sun to come up. I can make this really pretty image. So I spent about 15 minutes like capturing this image of this great blue heron on the causeway over. And so I then ride over the causeway, get to Bunch Beach and as I, whoops, as I'm get as I, I get Bunch Beach, I see this woman pulling this mangrove cuckoo out of this mist net. And they had just played a tape and the thing had flown across the road and got caught in the net for their banding uh, exercise. And so big year listing convention suggested that I could have counted this bird as soon as the researchers released it. But I didn't do any of the dirty work to find this individual bird. And I didn't want my life or mangrove cuckoo to come in such kind of a questionable fashion. So even though I could have counted this bird on my big year list, I decided not to. And I think that the bike is proof that I'm all about the the, the how, not the how many. Like if, if it was about how many for me, I would have I would have driven around and flown around like everybody else. But the how is really important to me. And so same thing here. Like I didn't do the work to see that bird. Had I been there when they played the tape and I saw it as a free flying bird before it came in, like I would have counted it, but it just didn't feel right. So I didn't. And I think that there's times in a big year where you need to use a little bit of judgment. Say, you know what? I'm not going to count that. And that's what I did. Uh, on the flip side of that is I was the, I saw Budgerigar and took a photo of Budgerigar. And I was the last big year birder who could include Budgerigar on, on their big year list. Because as of May of that year, they were thought to be completely extirpated. Uh, so I'm still credited with taking the last known photo of a believed to be wild Budgerigar in Florida. It was over on Hermoso Beach on the west side, like north of Tampa. 
So that's a p- interesting piece of trivia. I'm just going to grab a quick sip of water. Uh, when I went through Fort Myers, uh, uh, the local newspaper interviewed me. And in addition to being a big Phillies fan, as they are now dominating the Arizona Diamondbacks, I am also a big Red Sox fan after my time in Boston. And so the guy who interviewed me is like, actually, we have a hookup with the team. Why don't we get you a ticket to go to a game? And so I rode my bike uh, after birding over to the stadium and the stadium staff like put my bike in the front office and they gave me my ticket. And lo and behold, I'm sitting in the front row. And so you can see my binoculars sitting there on the desk. And the dude sitting next to me leans over. and He's like, dude, I got to ask, like, how blind are you? I mean, you're in the front row. Why do you need binoculars? And I'm like, no, 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 man. You don't even understand. I rode my bike here from Boston. I'm looking for birds. And I explained that behind that left field fence over there was a marsh where somebody had e-birded a short-tailed hawk a few days previously. And I didn't have that bird at this moment. So I, I had to be prepared in case that bird went flying over the left field fence. So that's why I have binoculars in the front row. Um from here, uh, the, my ride around the Gulf was really nice. Like the Florida ha- Panhandle was beautiful. So, uh, like the Gulf portions of Mississippi, of Alabama and Mississippi, and even Louisiana were fantastic. I hadn't been to New Orleans before, so that was a lot of fun. But I got over to Texas, and as it, as kind of a loose timetable for myself when I started my adventure, I'd like I'd like to be in Texas on or around April fifteenth. But considering the terrible weather, my cycling inexperience, like. The fact that I got hit by a car in Florida, you can read about that. That gets a whole chapter in the book. And I had so many flat tires, despite all of these apparent derailments. Like I made it to Texas on April 13th. And then the only big fallout of the whole spring happened on April 15th. So I was there in time for it. And that's when I found this black-throated blue warbler. I was rolling along on my bike and I saw it out of the corner of my eye. And I was able to get a picture of it. And then I rode back. I rode the five miles back to Sabine Woods, actually, to tell everyone who was there that I had found this bird. Everybody had been sharing birds with me the whole year. And this was likely the only rarity that I was going to find. So it was nice to be able to share this with other people. I was able to get things like Swainson's Warbler. Uh, And by, uh, I guess, April 27th, I had found all of the migrants that I expected to find on the Texas coast, save for three. And I had set a May 1 departure deadline as to when I wanted to start riding across western Texas, which I knew would be the hardest part of the entire trip. And so uh, even though I didn't have yellow-bellied flycatcher and black-billed cuckoo and morning warbler, I decided to leave the Texas coast four days earlier than I'd planned. And without going into too much detail, the wind was going to be from the southeast for those four days. And that would keep the birding slow. And I didn't want to spend four days birding and potentially come up with no new species. And I was really, really scared about riding this stretch right here because the towns were really few and far between. And that meant that food, water, and shelter were really few and far between. Um, Unlike the coast where there's bailouts where you can stop at a motel here or stay with a birder there like once you leave town a you have to know that you can make it all the way to town b because there's nothing there's no bailout on the way Uh, it's going to be hot every day was over 90 degrees somewhere over 100 and once you get off the texas coast the prevailing wind comes from the west southwest like straight across the state and so all of that kind of riding west of austin was going to be riding into the wind and uh temperatures of 100 degrees and so i said you know what? i want to face this fear with an extra four days in hand and i'll leave those birds on the table and i decided i would start most of my rides at 4 35 in the morning to while it was cool and while there was no wind so i rode i-10 all the way from uh all the way from austin to the arizona state line so i rode 800 miles on the same road and i do those rides from like five in the morning until noon so that i could get off the road by the time the wind really kicked up and the heat really bore down on me. But after that long transit, I got to Arizona and Arizona was amazing. Like uh, I basically got every, I spent two weeks bouncing between the Chiricahuas, the Huachucas, Patagonia, Sonoida Creek, Tucson Desert Museum, Madeira Canyon, uh, Santa Rita's. And I just cleaned up. I got all the regular birds like <laughs> Trogon, red-faced warbler, buff-bellied flycatcher, but I also got white-eared hummingbird. I got black cap gnatcatcher. And I got a juvenile common blackhawk 10 minutes after getting Montezuma quail. And I got Rufus capped warbler. And so like the dominoes were just falling so fast at this stage that I looked back at my decision to leave the Texas coast a bit early 
And yeah, I left three birds on the table, but already like because of the extra time that I have, like I intersected every possible bird that I could have got in Arizona. And had I been on any other timetable, it would have been worse, whether that's one bird worse or three birds worse. So like the dominoes just felt started to fall really, really well in Arizona. Um, and by May 29th, I had 457 species. So I was two, three quarters of the way, I guess two th- 75% of the way to my goal of 600 uh, after just five months, which is how these big years generally go. You get a lot in the first five months and then you have to work harder and harder from there on out. Um, this was a good story. Uh, I, I was riding along in this rattlesnake. I wasn't paying attention and it like lunged at me from the side of the road. I almost rode over it. And so I kind of swerved out of the way, caught my breath and then got down on the pavement and snapped a few pics of this big Western diamondback. It was about five feet long. So it's probably a good thing that it didn't get me. Um, I mean, riding through the desert Southwest, like now I'm in the Western US and things are really getting spectacular. Uh, Riding through Monument Valley was incredible. I had never been there before and I had no idea as to the scale of these rock formations. I just felt like an ant as I was pedaling through here uh, for that morning. Uh, This is one of the few photos I have of myself with my bike. I I actually flagged somebody down on the side of the road and was like, hey, look, stop, stop, stop. Can you can you take a photo of me? And I already had this image in my mind, right, of this silly movie. And there were times in the year when I looked like this, right, with the long hair and the big ugly beard and so on and so forth. But I show this slide, like this forest had all of these people, these hangers on who were following him around the country. And I had followers as well, but mine were online. And I mentioned that because the blog is really what gave this adventure a lot of shape and a lot of traction because it allowed me to bring people from around the country and around the world with me on every step of the adventure, every pedal turn of the adventure, so to speak. Uh, And not only was the blog a good way to find housing and have people chime in about strategic decisions and bird finding, but the blog in the same way that AA is designed to give alcoholics kind of accountability and support, my blog followers gave me that same accountability and support. And there were several very notable moments in the year that you can read about where I thought about quitting, but I realized I had to keep the adventure going as much for my followers who were like invested in my success and invested in the project as for myself. And so it was really nice knowing that I had the support of all of these people online. So that's why I present that slide to make to make sure I tell you that story. Um, This was outside of Silverton, Colorado, and biking through Colorado was spectacular. I don't know how many of you guys have ridden that Durango Silverton Railroad and climbed up the huge mountains there, but I biked up that stuff. So I had to gain about 6,000 vertical feet that day across 55 miles of just straight uphill. Um, This is actually the other side of Silverton. I'm now going up over Red Mountain Pass towards Uray, and this ride was absolutely spectacular. Uh, I have the bike up towards 12,000 feet here, and... I have a whole chapter that kind of traverses that Monument Valley to Uray uh, distance because I watching the Western U.S. change from like the red rocks forever burning in in in, in the desert Southwest over the course of five or six days to this was amazing. Like the scenes were so dichotomous, but I got to see every little transition between like, like Monument Valley and the tundra as I rode my bike between those two points in the course of this week. So there was a very like pioneer aspect to this. And I I really felt like I was doing something totally unique and totally different. Like the, the more of the American West that I saw. Um, White tailed ptarmigan was a bird that gave me absolute fits. Uh, There isn't really any, the bird is usually above 12,000 feet and there isn't really anywhere to stay. Um, above about 8,500 feet in Colorado. So every time I wanted to look for white-tailed ptarmigan, and I would do it as I transited these big mountain passes, I had to leave seven or 8,000 feet and climb up four or 5,000 feet. That would take all morning. And then I'd have to take my shoes off, take my biking shoes off, put on my hiking boots, stash the bike, and then go stomping around on the tr- tundra for several hours looking for this bird that looks like a rock. And so I did this like four or five times as I went over Red Mountain Pass, as I went over Loveland Pass, as I went over Monarch Pass, and so on and so forth. I just kept missing ptarmigan and brown-capped rosy finch. Uh, But when I finally got to Grinella Pass, boom, like I did the same thing. I was hiking up there, and I had like a great view. Uh, I almost stepped on this bird, and then I followed it around for the next hour. And being up on the tundra in the summer in Colorado was actually quite dangerous because lightning storms pop up really, really frequently and without a lot of warning. And so... 
there was lightning forecast this afternoon. So I had a very limited time window when I could be up above tree line. And so I, I got this bird in like that two or three hour window and then scampered off right as lightning started. And I, I mentioned this because two tundra hikers were killed and 14 sent to the hospital two weeks after this in Rocky Mountain National Park, which is like the next the next mountain rise over. And so these are the kind of things you don't have to think about in a car, but like when you're up there on a bike and and you're having to stomp around in tundra and you have to evacuate like without the shelter of a car, like lightning is a huge issue. And so there were all these things like wind, weather, lightning that, that I had to worry about that petroleum powered birders didn't. Uh, this is a great story. This guy, Chris Rurick was a blog follower of mine and said, I want to come and spend a night with you. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to, you're going to go to Guanella Pass and then you're going to come right down below tree line to Guanella Pass campground. And I'm going to meet you there with my tent and a bunch of food and sleeping bags. And we'll spend the night there. And that'll give you a second bite at Guanella without having to drop all the way down to Georgetown, which is at like 8,500 feet. So he did that. He met me after my ptarmigan triumph. I still hadn't seen brown capped rosy finch. And then the following morning, after this huge lightning storm that went through overnight, I rode my bike up to the pass and he drove and I threw my stuff into his car. And then we hiked to the top of Mount Bierstadt, which was 14,060 feet high. And right near the summit, we got brown capped rosy finch. So it was super cool when blog readers like assert, inserted themselves into my adventure. And then we found birds together because then they become part of the story. And it was to find out that Chris was a Stanford alum. And so the whole time that we're hiking and eating dinner and whatnot and hanging out, we're talking about funny stories from Stanford and so on and so forth. So it was so much fun to be able to share this adventure with people as, as they, as I said, inserted themselves. Uh, this is how I spent a lot of my summer. Um, the grouse were the hardest birds that I had to find the whole year, because in a normal big year, you just get in your car, you fly to Denver, you rent a car, you come on my tour, grouse 2024. And you just drive around to all the leks and you collect the birds with, with basically no effort, just one each morning. But those birds all disperse off lek during the summer. And so they're very, very difficult to find. And they, they don't want to be found. And they're shy and lethargic. And they don't fly unless you step right on them. And so this was my view for about a week going through north, southern Wyoming, northern Colorado, and western U and eastern Utah, just sage. And I had to like walk through 40 or 50 miles of sage, clapping my hands, Woo! Woo! And hooting to try to like increase my presence to try to increase the likelihood that I'm going to flush a bird. Because if I don't scare it up and out of the two feet of foliage, I'm never going to see it. And so I was successful in doing this, but this is my view of all the grouse, right? It's of grouse fleeing habitat in, in, at high speed. So I got greater sage grouse this way and I got sharp tailed grouse this way. I was able to get, but not photograph, uh, greater prairie chicken in eastern Colorado, which is a bird I, I detoured to get, which I didn't think I'd have the time or energy to get. Gunnison sage grouse, I flushed off of a road, like after a four, after I guess like a four or five hour ride looking for them. I'd spent three days looking for them. So the grouse were just really, really hard to get, but I got all of them with a lot of work. Uh, so now I've kind of gone through I've gone through, through Wyoming. And as I told you earlier, my original plan was to kind of cut across north central Oregon and then hit the Oregon coast to come south. But I underestimated how how much cycling I could do. And I to this point in the year, and I'll spoil it, to the end of the year, I did not miss a day to sickness or to injury. I missed days to outright fatigue, but I didn't miss a single day to sickness or injury. And with that kind of time that I assumed that I would lose, I was able to expand my route up to the Pacific Northwest to go get things like boreal chickadee and spruce grouse. And I realized that time up on the Puget Sound would guarantee me mugal, which is a bird I'd probably be moving south below because I was going to transit the West Coast in September and then be in Southern California in October. And they're not down there by then. I would have missed them. I could have easily missed that bird. Same thing for a couple of birds I'll show you later. Uh, Marble Merlet, I could have looked for in California, but it would be like a 10 minute search on on the Puget Sound. So, and gray crowned rosy finch, I didn't have on my route. I wasn't going to go to the Sierras, but I realized I could get it on Mount Rainier. So detouring five or 600 miles seems like a lot, but on a per bird basis, if I could get all four or five of those birds, then a hundred miles isn't that, isn't that obscene. Like I've ridden that many, that many miles for birds here in the Bay area. Uh, but the North Cascades were really spectacular. This is the ride where I, where I got gray crowned rosy finch. And I started in Mazama, which is in the Methow Valley on the east side of the Cascades in this morning. And I climbed about 3,500 feet up to Washington Pass, uh, maybe, I don't know, 30, 35 miles to get there. I got there around midday 
And then at the suggestion of a friend, I actually stopped riding, took off my hiking shoes, put on my boots, and then hiked up that trail that you can see on the other side of that lake over there. So I hiked another 2,000 feet up, three and a half miles up to Maple Pass, where I was able to score Great Crown Rosie Finch along my route and amidst elevation I'd already gained. If I didn't do that, I was going to have to drop to Seattle and then re-climb like seven or 8,000 feet to get to Mount Rainier, which is where I was planning to look for Rosie Finch. So inserting this long seven mile hike into the middle of a 90 mile ride was a risk, but it saved me three days of riding down the line. So in all of this, it's a question of how much pain can you bear at the moment? And if you bear that pain and get the bird now, how much pain, agony, anguish, misery, continue that like thought line, will that save you down the line? And so I was riding a super high after I got Great Crown Crazy Finch. And my path after this took me in that sweeping valley, which runs kind of west down towards Puget Sound there. And I thought I'd have a 50 mile coast downhill to the coast from here. But there was a west wind that blew up that valley at 20 miles an hour. And it was blowing so hard that I had to pedal the bike to get it to go downhill. And if you haven't been experienced the misery of pedaling a bike to get it to go downhill, when you thought you'd be able to roll 50 miles, like energy free, I'll tell you, it was awful. It was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I ended up in Marble Mount that night. So I had biked 90 miles with 7,000 feet of climbing along the length. With a seven thousand, with a seven mile hike in the middle, during which I gained two thousand feet, I left Mazama at six thirty in the morning. I didn't get to Mazama uh, to Marble Mount until seven thirty p.m. I was moving for thirteen hours. That's like longer than people move for Ironman triathlons. But once I got to the coast, I birded the sound. I cut out the Westport in Washington. Birded my way south. Uh, I got to Haystack Rock. I actually risked losing Tufted Puffin by expanding my route up to uh, Washington because Tufted Puffins nest on Haystack Rock, which is the big piece of geology featured on the right there. But then most of them leave mid-August to go back out to sea. Uh, my original plan was to be there kind of like, I don't know, August 20th or something. But in expanding my route, I didn't get there until the beginning of September. Um, but fortunately, I was able to get one of what was it, the last tufted puffins that was hanging around. I got it like right at sunset on, on this day, which is pretty cool. I have a crappy photo that they don't bother showing. Uh, the Oregon coast and Northern California was spectacular. Riding through the Humboldt Redwoods and things was amazing. Um, I always do this. I don't know why I don't learn this. This morning, I got Black Rail. I had spent nights like in the marsh in Petaluma. I spent a night at China Camp up in San Rafael. My wife, uh, my then girlfriend, now wife was, was she used the year to travel as well. And so we intersected at several points and she had our tent with us, with her when we met in, in kind of the Bay area. And so I could camp in the marshes those nights and I would get up every two hours and go out and tape for black rail. And it took like three nights of this before I finally got the bird in, Peto, in, in Santa Venetia. And that is my view of it. Uh, so this is, I'm crossing the Bay Bridge or the, the Golden Gate Bridge right after scoring Black Rail. So I'm like super, super stoked at this time. And then I actually got Sabin's Gall down in Sunnyvale, down in your neck of the woods, right? Santa Clara County uh, this afternoon and then spent the night in Palo Alto. Um, from there, I cut over the mountains to, whoops, to Half Moon Bay. And I spent the night, I went down to, to, Pescadero and spent the night with Mark Kudrav, which is super fun telling swapping bike birding stories, so on and so forth. Um, and then I backtracked the following day, I backtracked up to uh, Half Moon Bay from Pescadero to get Red Throated Pippet. And that was super cool. Alvaro found that bird. And that's when I met Chris and Malia and we've been friends ever since then. They actually went out on the beach and found the bird in the morning and kept an eye on it while I rode from Pescadero. And then I rode all the way down to Santa Cruz. And then Malia calls me two days later and says, there's a Pacific golden plover like 10 feet from where the red-throated pipit showed up. And I was like, oh, why couldn't it have been there two days earlier? And I had chased Pacific golden plover five or six times moving down the Pacific coast without intersecting it. But I decided to turn around and backtrack all, all the way back to Half Moon Bay. And I got Pacific golden plover there. And I, I actually found it in the harbor. And it was super, super confiding and let me take some amazing photos of it. Um, I mean, you can't beat the California coast any time of the year, but you really can't beat it in the fall, which is like the sunniest month. So then I went through a, by Pigeon Point Lighthouse, 
Big Sur was amazing. Uh, there's a reason that like every car commercial is filmed on that bridge in the background over my seat there because it's like the most scenic road in the whole country. You know, I'm riding along and I suddenly feel an urge to buy a Ford Focus or something because I've seen that ad so many times. Uh, also gave me a chance to get Condor, which was amazing. I, I saw one at a distance. It was so far away. It wasn't worth photographing it, but I saw that bird hanging out with Brian Pattison. So that was pretty cool that you have like East Coast and West Coast pelagic birders looking for raptors. <laughs> that was a lot of fun birding with him. Uh, it was just spectacular. Uh, and then I will say my worst ride of the year was to cut inland. So I continued down here to Cambria and then went inland to Paso Robles. My worst ride of the year was from Paso Robles to Taft. Uh, in the interest of time and suspense, I will let you read about that. It was hell on earth, but there was an important teaching point in there. So I'll leave that. But I got down to Southern California. Uh, I was able to score. There was a yellow green vireo that had spent uh, had spent like ten days at Fred Hut Fred Hutchinson Fred Rosencrantz National Cemetery in Point Loma in San Diego. I arrived there on day ten of its stay at two thirty, and the cemetery closed at four thirty. I had two hours to find the bird, and I did. And the bird left that night, so that was like the only one that I had a crack at the whole day. Nobody saw it again, and then I spent a bunch of time sea watching and in in. in in San Diego and La Jolla, I spent a bunch of time sea watching in Monterey and got things like Jaegers and a bunch of shearwaters. So it was nice to fluff up my, my mostly terrestrial list with some pelagic birds. But I, I got a bunch of other good stuff down in Southern California, ancient Miralette being one of those. I did not expect to get that anywhere on my trip. Not only would, did I think I'd be moving south like faster than it would come down, but they usually don't get to Southern California. So one swam right into, right into Mission Bay and gave us like incredible views across two days. I was also able to score Thera's gulp, the salt and sea. And that's another bird that I didn't think would be in by the time I went through the geography that it ultimately occupies by midwinter. So those were two huge gets. Um, this was potentially the, the like crowning moment of my year to this point. I spent two days at the salt and sea. And after the first day, I got a phone call saying somebody just found a Rufus back Robin. Actually, Tom Benson, you guys are California birders. So you'll recognize that name, found a Rufus back Robin in 29 Palms, which is kind of north of Joshua Tree. And I was like, I am not chasing that bird. That's a 150 mile ride one way for a vagrant that could easily pick up and leave in the two full days it's going to take me to ride there. So I just birded the salt and sea, just general birding a second day because I already had the, the yellow footed gull. And I just, I just wanted to spend some time there because I knew it was drying up and I knew it would, it's going to be gone at some point. But after that night, I'm back in my motel in Brawley and I get a phone call from somebody saying, yo, the Robin is still, the Robin is still here. And so at this stage, like this is where, this is kind of where the title for the book comes from that I, I can't really say no at this stage. Like I'm, I'm binging on bike birding the same way that I used to binge on alcohol and cocaine. I, I can't stop myself. And so the following morning, instead of riding south and east to Arizona, as I thought I would, I'm now riding 150 miles to go look for this Rufus Beck Robin that may or may not be there in two days when I finally get there. So I ride 110 miles on the first day to North Palm Springs, and then I ride the remaining 45 miles or so up this huge mountain and then down the backside to get to 29 Palms. I get to the place at like 10 in the morning. Nobody's found the bird so far. There's about a dozen people looking for it. And so I settle into the into the collaborative search and 10 minutes later, bam, like the bird pops out, like right at the top of a palm. I couldn't believe it. And so like, as I'm, as I was standing there waiting for this bird, I was like, I'm going to ride 300 miles for nothing. I'm going to, this is going to be all for nothing. All I'm going to have to show for it is like the sorest ass on earth. And that's exactly when this bird came out. And so returning to the previous slide, by the time I biked the, the remaining 50 miles back to, I think I rode to Indio that day and the remaining 80 back to my Brawley motel. I biked 304 miles and did not move an inch, but I could claim the Rufus Beck Robin. It was the furthest that I rode for one bird the entire year. 305 miles is the same distance as from Boston to Philadelphia, from Chicago to St. Louis, or from Vancouver, British Columbia to Portland, Oregon. So I rode that far to get not just one species, one representative of one, of one rare species. So that was amazing. That's like what I cite is my most amazing feat from the whole year. Let me see how we're doing on time here. All right, we're getting to the end here. Um, this is, I got back to Southeastern Arizona and that kind of uh, closed my Western loop. And from here East, uh, the novelty is kind of gone. I've seen almost all the birds I'm going to see. 
Uh, I saw 100 new species between Central Texas and Southeastern Arizona in, on my spring transit, but I could expect only two, Sprague's Pippet and Baird Sparrow, both of which nest in the upper Midwest and Southern Canada, but have small wintering populations in the desert Southwest. So I was able to get those two birds. And I also got Sinaloa Wren, which had showed up about six weeks prior. And I'd kind of been monitoring the reports and I had a good idea of, of where and how to get this bird. So that was a really good get. Uh, but now the novelty is gone and I'm riding over the same ground again. And this was the worst part of, of the entire year. Uh, the polar vortex that had plagued the first part of my year reemerged. Uh, when I went through Las Cruces, it was 25 degrees. Uh, when I was going through Western Texas, Fort Hancock and Van Horn, Fort Stockton, it was barely above freezing. There was like a Northeast wind blowing in my face at 20 miles an hour. It was like absolutely miserable. Like if I could have designed the worst conditions for that time of the year in geography, that's what I would have thrown at myself. It was just awful. Um, my bike was falling apart. My body was falling apart. There were no new birds. But once I got to Sonora and I turned south and I rode off the southern end of the Edwards Plateau, things picked up again. And so I was able to get green kingfisher and olive sparrow and long-billed thrasher and great kiskadee and some of these like traditionally south, south Texas species. And then things really heated up when I got down to Laredo. So uh, I was able to get white-colored seed eater, which is a kind of a sneaky bird. I was able to get tropical parallel, which can be difficult down there in the winter. Uh, I spent like three days stomping Quinta Mazatlan and finally caught up with a bird that other people have been reporting all around. They're like, yeah, I just saw it over there half an hour ago. But it took like three days of dedicated searching to find that. I got Guru Bildani at Estero. I got Alplomato Falcon out uh, on Port Isabel Road. Let's see, I got uh, Ferruginous Pygmy Owl out on the King Ranch. They, they bent their usual rules and allowed the ranch biologist to take me out there. And he met me at the gate. And I locked my bike up kind of inside the gate. And then we walked to the area where we could tape for the owl, which is pretty cool. And I scored hook-billed kite, which is a bird that had eluded me uh, to that point in the trip. I'd spent a lot of time looking at the sky, hoping it would fly by. And this one flew right over my head, uh, a dark phase, no less. So it was that was a really cool get at the end of the year. But all of those kind of pale in comparison to, to this bird which showed up on Thanksgiving Day at Estero Llano Grande. And somebody reported an odd bird that they couldn't identify in, in a particular part of the park. And so me and Tiffany Kirstens, who set the lower 48 big year record a couple of years ago, um, and Bill Sane, who's a Texas birder, and the late Mary Gustafson, who unfortunately passed this last year, the four of us and a couple other folks went over to this area and dug out this bird, which was pretty cool. We didn't get photos of it the first time we saw it. So it took like a whole afternoon of searching, but we eventually secured photos of, of what we believed was the first legitimate red-legged honey creeper to be seen in the ABA area. And so it was either a immature or a female, didn't show any cage, cage wear, like, behaved like a wild bird. So we were really stoked. This was amazing. And like, by the end of the afternoon, all these people had like abandoned Thanksgiving dinner and come down to the reserve to, to try to get a glimpse of this bird. But that was First, that ended up ultimately being accepted as the first ABA record. So pretty cool to get a first ABA record after riding, I don't know, 16,500 miles. Um, after I wrapped up in the valley, I rode up to Aransas Bay and got Whooping Crane. I joined a Yellow Rail banding expedition uh, that was part of the, uh, the Freeport Christmas Count at San Bernard National Wildlife Refuge. And because I was officially part of the banding expedition here, uh, and I had a chance to see these birds as fruit free flying individuals before I netted them. I had like a butterfly net that I was netting them with. There's a fun story about that in the book too. Uh, it was cool to be able to like physically hold a rail and like look at this super secretive bird from six, six inches away. So that was a real highlight of the year. Harris the Sparrow obviously was not in central Texas on my spring transit, but was an easy pickup in the winter. And then I got Little Gull, uh, as I told you, on White Rock Lake outside of Dallas. And then I added Smith Longspur as my last bird of the year. So that was species number 615. I did not count Florida's introduced muscovies when I went through Florida because I was hoping that I'd get a wild one in Texas. When that didn't happen, I assigned muscovy number 616. Egyptian goose was made countable the year uh, during the year. And I saw it while I was in Florida. So I made that species 617 as convention dictates. And then the honey creeper, when it was accepted a year later, ended up being species 618. So that's what I ended up with. So I ended up with 618 species and 17,830 miles on the bike. And 
I don't know, 40 flat tires or something. So, I mean, what started out as this crazy idea, and I ran this idea by so many people when I before I started, like, dude, nobody can do this. This is this is impossible. This is crazy. I ended up executing to a T. And I, I think I credit I credit my scientific career for that because when I was doing experiments, like there was always a contingency, like always a backup plan that I was starting, assuming that the first experiment would fail. And because I'm good at logistics and and engineering globally, like here this was travel and bird engineering. I got all the birds I wanted to see and I, I didn't get caught out in without a place to sleep. And I, I, I always found a place to eat or had a way to get food. So like the logistics are kind of my strength, which is why I say I'm a really good guy to lead birding tours because I know how to deal with stuff when stuff gets thrown at me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was just it was a one of a kind, really, really amazing adventure. And so this year was so much more than about birds. Um, I write a lot about the people that I met along the way. I think that. I, more so than probably any other big year birder, had an amazing view to the American public, like a really wide cross section of the American public. I stayed with some of the most liberal people I've ever met, and I stayed with some of the most conservative people I've ever met. And everybody, like no matter what walk of life from which they came, took care of me, fed me, housed me, made sure I had air in my bike tires. Like, I think that my story is a really good commercial for America at a time when America could use a little bit of positive news about about some of these divisions that we've sowed and it, it was pretty cool because i didn't i didn't really experience too much of that uh there's a little bit and you can read about that but generally speaking people people of all walks of life took care of me the physical and mental challenges cannot be overstated um for instance i didn't listen to any podcasts or news or music or sports radio or anything while i was writing part of that was practical and that i wanted to hear singing birds and part of it was safety and that i wanted to kind of know where where cars and trucks were, but I also wanted the challenge of being inside my own head and thoughts with no external programming for an entire year. Um, the physical heart side of it was obviously was obviously ridiculous, but I survived it and I didn't die. And that's something I can claim, like that my big year put my life at, at risk in a way that no other nationwide big year uh, birder has experienced. The amount of organization cannot be overstated. Like having to find places to eat, having to call gas stations in Western Texas to make sure that they're still open because if they're closed, then it's 50 miles of riding in a hundred degree heat to find water. Um, I had to look at aerial photographs of my, of my route to know if the road was dirt. I had to know the local weather every single day because if the road was dirt for 20 miles and it rained three inches three days before, that's a mud road and I can't ride that. And if I do ride it, then all of a sudden riding those 20 miles feels like riding a hundred. And so there were so many things like I, I had to know, I had to call hotels and be like, do you have a spot for me? Because if you don't, then I have to go to another town in some of these really small places. So the logistics cannot be overstated. And you put all this together and like, this was a huge personal triumph for me. I left, I left a good career. I left a relatively short thing, a really pr relatively prestigious thing because I wasn't happy. And I found happiness and success in forms that I couldn't have imagined prior to pedaling the bicycle for an entire year. So this is this is the graphic that I that I show people. Like this is this is like how you can represent my year. And like dot number one was was Snowy Owl in in Massachusetts, and dot number two hundred and thirty five was the Sagres Flycatcher in Florida, and dot five seventeen was was Great Gray Owl in Wyoming, and, and dot whatever 560 was uh red-throated pipit in california and dot 604 was red-legged honey creeper in texas and, and the picture that it emerges isn't like a picture of a bird it's a picture of this life-changing adventure and so what did i learn from this i learned that crazy ideas are good ideas if you get a whole room full of people and you say this is my idea and they all say that's a good idea what that means is that you have a safe idea because it computes with everybody and safe ideas are boring. You want to have an idea that at least half the people say you're, you're totally nuts if you try to execute this because that means it's sufficiently different from what's already being done that it's worthwhile to do it. You know, like that's that's what life is about. It's like putting yourself out there and taking a risk to do something different. And I hadn't really done that to that point in my life. Like I was really good at school and and that stuff came easily to me. and. I kind of had this vision of just staying in that school zone where, where I could prove that I was relatively intelligent. I would receive a certain number of accolades at periodic intervals. And, and I knew I'd be successful. Like 
it was a big risk to leave that and, and try to do something totally different. And lastly, I'll just kind of leave with the idea that birds, animals, and all living things on the planet need advocates. And that it's it's possible to do fun stuff with an eye towards the environment. Like birders must set an example for others to follow because right now, like we're all, we're all seeing how bad the climate situation is. And I'm not gonna say everybody needs to start riding a bike and and not driving to bird. I'm not gonna say don't travel, but I know that I do a lot of travel for work and for pleasure, but to offset that, I've made the conscious decision four years to go, to go vegetarian. So I don't eat red meat anymore. Um, in my mind, it's really hard to both care about the planet and eat meat. So cutting back on the amount of meat you eat or uh, limiting it all together is, is a really easy way. The dairy industry would hate me, like the meat industry would hate this talk. Uh, but like, that's a really easy way to like lessen your footprint. And there's other ways to do it that are more controversial, like not having kids and like so on and so forth. But like, we need to start thinking about these and, and talking about these discussions publicly. The reality is that we have to lower our standard of living. And that's a tough discussion to have because if we don't do that, we know what the, we know how the tape is going to end and it's more storms and more, more disaster. So just something to think about. I don't want to end on a down note, but think about what you as an individual birder can do to, to lessen your footprint. And maybe you do ride a bike one day a week when you go birding. So uh, with that, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to, there's the cover of the book. I'm going to end. I think I was about at an hour or so. Uh, I wanted to leave lots of time to take questions. I'll take questions for at least like 15 or 20 minutes. I, I think I have the time to do that. So yeah, uh, with that, I'll thank you guys.